CES 2019 Day 1 Recap, Air Taxis, Anthem Trailers, Gaming Monitors, and more coming up on today's episode of The Latest in Tech News. Hey Gadget here, you're just in time for the latest episode of the world's only 3-in-1 show on everything tech, gadgets, and gaming news. If you're new here, be sure to click on that subscribe button right now so that you don't miss out on an episode. My name is Taylor Merrick, and I'll be your host. Now, let's recap on the latest tech news. Seeing as how CES is happening all this week, let's find out what's going on. So, uh, we got Tom's Guide, we got something from Ars Technica, we got something from um, CNET, we got a whole bunch of menagerie of stuff. Um, unfortunately, I'm not at CES 2019 this year. Consumer Electronics Show, you know, the big uh, good C gad three auto we smart ai show that's happening all this week yeah um i'm stuck here at home unfortunately so i can't get you the latest videos or, or live tweet or get photos or exclusive interviews or live stream none of that i'd love to be able to do that because i guarantee you when i land on the floor at ces um my approach to gadgets and technology is going to be completely different granted i'm not gonna be the only one who's not going to oogle out over the latest TVs or, or gaming monitors. Sure, of course, I will, you know, from the bigwigs, but I'm also going to be looking for the stuff that's a little bit harder to find, you know, the, the tech that's actually cool, the tech that's actually making a difference, the tech that is mind-boggling and, and, and life-changing, you know, cool stuff like that. Um, So, we're going to have to settle for me recapping videos and, and, and photos and... Uh, articles that happened by the way if you're listening to the audio version of this episode you can always head on over to youtube.com forward slash tech news gadget or facebook.com forward slash tech news gadget and get get the uh, full video uh, along with any pictures that are going on today so um, be sure to head on over and do that but uh, let's jump in and see what's going on so day one recap from tom's guide they had a whole crew hitting the ground there um first up we have LG's 88-inch AK TV that doubles as a giant speaker. And here's the here's the photo of it, and it says, Cramming good sound into flat-screen TVs has never been easy, but last year Sony came up with a novel approach. Use the screen itself to broadcast sound. Interestingly enough, LG has jumped on a bandwagon with its crystal sound OLED display. The screen on this 88-inch UHD TV produces 3.2.2 channel Dolby Atmos sound without the need for any internal speakers or external soundbars, making the gadget both elegant and functional. Um, although we'll, we'll, we'll see more on the price tag when it comes out to consumers. Also, coming up is the Matrix PowerWatch 2 that almost never needs any charging. Interestingly enough, uh, environmentalists have pointed out for a long time that the biggest source of energy in our solar system, the sun, is woefully underused to power our society. So the Matrix PowerWatch 2 is a smartwatch that wants to rectify that. The device uses solar power as well as the user's body heat to keep its battery charged almost indefinitely. That's a good thing since it means you can use its fitness tracking, GPS, and heart rate monitor capabilities without ever having to worry about plugging it in. Uh, it looks like a big old wristwatch though. Kind of cool. Um, not as elegant as a Rolex, but... Kind of promising, digital, cool, techy at the exact same time. Also, Samsung's modular micro LED Windows TV debuts, and uh, we'll be covering a little bit more of this in a later article because, well, what's CES without TVs? I mean, goodness, it's like saying, well, what's going on at a cattle show if there's not cows there? I ain't gonna watch this. Uh, to which everybody else says, why does it have to be TVs? It's just electronics, it's not just TVs. So manufacturers have been spending years demonstrating that they know how to make really good large TVs, but what about the small ones? Well, Samsung's modular micro LED tech wants to take the TV experience out of the living room and move it to, well, anywhere you want, really. Using small, customizable tiles, you can assemble a screen to fit almost any size and configuration, and the tiles will set the resolution for you automatically. This means you can take your tech with you into the kitchen, bathroom, ceiling, it's up to you, and however you want to assemble it, also up to you as well. Well, we'll be covering that in a little bit. Also, gaming nerds, um, the Asus ROG Mothership dropped, and let's just say when it dropped, it went boom. Not in a bad way, in a good way. 
because what we're looking at here is something that is both a laptop and a desktop. Gaming laptops usually cost a lot, as such it's often hard to justify buying a desktop too. Now the Asus ROG Mothership is one of the first laptops that actively tries to split the difference with a detachable monitor and a standalone keyboard. You can snap the Mothership together and use it as a traditional laptop or rest the screen on a kickstand, bring the keyboard in close and play the setup like a desktop. Up to you and effortless to switch. Looks juicy. More details coming up. Hopefully soon, um, or, or just search around a little bit for it. Also, NVIDIA RTX 2060 makes ray tracing affordable. They decided to surprise everybody during their keynote today. They just dropped it along with um, the Anthem trailer, which we'll be looking at in a, in a little bit. Um, but they dropped it and they said, Hey, you know how you guys were wondering, you know, this new graphics card coming up with this ray tracing technology? You know how you're all worried about it costing a lot of money? Well, it's not. See? NVIDIA has made much of the innovative ray tracing technology in its graphics card, but up until now the feature has only been available in very expensive GPUs. The GeForce RTX 2060 will debut at $349 and include all that technology and a little bit more, hopefully bringing technology to the masses. So we'll see how the developers attach themselves to this, if they want to take advantage of the technology, we'll see. Also, HP debuts its AMD powered Chromebook. Up until this point, it was most exclusively Intel. So now that AMD is getting into the Chromebook, kind of changing it up a little bit. Now Intel's going, hey, wait, don't be, oh, dang it. Oh, well, if you can, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, AMD has usually always done a good job. N not saying anything bad against Intel, but I've always been impressed with AMD and usually how they do stuff. Now, Chromebooks are at their best when they're inexpensive, but that's often difficult to pull off with costly Intel processors. See, going back to the point that I just mentioned, as such, HP has turned to AMD for the HP Chromebook 14, which will run on an AMD A4 or A6 CPU with Radon 4 or R5 GPUs built right in. The least expensive system costs 269 bucks and should still deliver more than enough power for everyday productivity and browsing. So that's all from Tom's Guide. Let's head on over to check out another article, shall we? So KitchenAid is getting into the swing of things. That, yep, they were at CES. Um, they debuted their KitchenAid with a Google Smart Display, and it's water resistant. Thanks to an IPX5 rating, you can just rinse it off after a messy cooking situation. And it has like a nice bulky little bottom that uh, it can actually stand upright without needing a, um, an additional stand or peg or something to hold it up or balance it. <coughs> Now, a big feature of these smart displays is a visual and audio walkthrough of cooking recipes, and with Google's platform open to third parties, it would only make sense that traditional kitchen appliance manufacturers would want to get in on the action, right? Enter the KitchenAid smart display, which takes all the features and functionality of Google's smart display platform, reference the Google Home Hub and the Lenovo smart display, and it wraps it up with an appliance name that will feel right at home, right next to your mixer or your fridge. The KitchenAid Smart Display sounds a lot like the other third-party Google Smart Displays with a 10-inch touchscreen and the usual Google Assistant software with smart home controls. KitchenAid is bringing two big hardware features to the table, though. First, compared to other third-party Google Smart Displays from JBL, LG, and Lenovo, this is a very compact design for something with a 10-inch display. Second, the KitchenAid has an IPX5 water resistance rating. KitchenAid says the device is rated for resistance to faucet water, so you could actually wash the smart display in the sink after a messy cooking session. Although you should probably unplug it first, that's just the usual rule with electronics and no sticking it in the bag of rice ain't going to do anything either. Besides running the same interface you'd find on the Google Home Hub or the Lenovo smart display, KitchenAid is throwing in some extra voice commands for its Yumly cooking app. The press release says you'll get Yumly voice and visual meal planning and guided cooking functionality. But keep in mind, this is in addition to the usual cooking guidance that is already built into the Google Smart Display software. No word on the release date yet, but this stupid ad just decided to keep popping up. No, I don't want to hear about that. A report coming out from CNET says the device will be out in the second half of 2019 and cost between $200 and $300. Also, uh, even though Apple wasn't technically at CES this year, they decided to go, hey, we're special enough to have our own event. Um, well, they finally set loose 
iTunes and AirPlay, and it was all over the place at CES. So, um, this year marked a stream of announcements from TV makers partnering with Apple on iTunes, AirPlay 2, and HomeKit. The goal for the company is to bring its content to more living rooms just in time for the expected launch of its long-awaited video streaming service. It's doing that by integrating its services into televisions that will be hitting the markets this year. Apple is starting to think more cross-platform and cross-device for services, which is definitely a good thing, tech analysis research analyst Bob O'Donnell said. Faced with slowing iPhone sales, Apple has to find a new way to make money, and expanding services is one of its biggest bets so far. That includes the rumored launch of a new video streaming service in early 2019. Over the past year, they've deployed a $1 billion budget, and they've been trying to get high-end filmmakers and, and television stars, including Walter Winfrey, Reese Witherspoon, Steven Spielberg, and they also hired two top executives from Sony Pictures Television to lead the effort. So obviously it would make sense, uh, coming out with a whole bunch of new TVs and gadgets, if you want to include it. Um, seeing that's how they're going, oh, well, why don't people want to watch stuff on smaller screens? I don't know, maybe it's because movies want to be seen in bigger 8K crystal UHD, the uh, bigger screen the better. You know, it, I, I was reading another article, uh, and it was basically saying CES seems to be taking everybody back to the 1980s in in a sense that everybody likes to be gathered around the TV the, instead of like a holographic display or 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 a small like smartphone device cuz okay come on be honest like why would you want to watch a full length movie like 1080p or 4K or 8K goodness could you imagine that on your phone and then just go oh yeah it's great i like watching it on a small phone no there's a reason why people like going to the movie theaters for new movies there's a reason why people like sitting at home and entertaining guests or themselves uh, and watching movies or television shows and binge-watching Netflix on a big screen. So what's what's the problem? I don't get it. Uh, see, this is what happens when you're a big company and you forget to move fast enough and nimble enough and then you get tripped up on the smaller companies going, Hey, guess what we did? <laughs> so it makes for um, entertainment. Um the rest of this article goes on to explain that um, the number of households with a streaming player has quadrupled in the last five years, but Apple trails Roku and Amazon in market share, and it seldom discounts its pricey Apple TV. So, who knows? Maybe this year we'll be looking at something different coming from Apple's event. Um, maybe a cheaper, more affordable Apple TV that can do the same thing, and hopefully they fix the problem with the stupid remote button, because I swear, I can't tell you. Okay, I have an Apple TV, disclaimer. But um, I can tell you, there's some times where I just want to take the stupid little uh, remote and snap it in half because it's bad. Um, it's problematic sometimes. Um, and then it fails to respond to commands at other times. And then the voice controls don't work at other times either. Um, so, bugs. Bugs. But other than that, it usually runs fine i usually don't have a problem except when i do so apple get your stuff together and uh fix it okay okay moving on so um remember that anthem trailer so moving on to gaming news um at ces yeah we'll be covering some more gaming news ish stuff in, in, in gadgets but uh for those of you all excited about anthem the trailer was dropped at CES 2019, and uh, NVIDIA announces their support for DLSS, which is their technology, and uh, of course, obviously, we, we got a video to go along with it. You guys want, you want to see the trailer? All right, let's, uh, let's take a look, shall we? Technology has always helped us unleash our creative potential by giving players more immersive experiences than ever before. In Anthem, head out into a chaotic and beautiful world. Fly across wondrous lands in your javelin exosuits. Why does this remind me Confront of Avatar deadly creatures. and Monster Hunter? Sorry. Formidable foes and awe-inspiring mysteries. NVIDIA takes us one step further 
by rendering our game with more precision and higher quality textures. Javelins, creatures, and combat have never looked better. We are happy to announce that we are working with NVIDIA to bring DLSS technology to Anthem. Check out Anthem on PC with Origin Access Premier on February 15th. All right, well, there you have it. The uh, trailer for Anthem, the brand new exclusive gameplay trailer, features a never before seen javelin, enemies, and environments. In addition, Nvidia has announced that the upcoming title from BioWare will support deep learning super sampling or DLSS for better visuals. Now, um, this was obviously in, in 4K uh, and revealed at the keynote. Um, interesting to note is that NVIDIA mentioned that the trailer reveals a brand new Javelin, but from the looks of it, it's merely Infiltrator or Ranger with customized visual gear. An open demo for Anthem will be released on February 1st on all available platforms. It's time for the fans to get their hands on Anthem and experience it for themselves. According to Mike Gamble, lead producer for Anthem last month, we truly hope they enjoy this taste of flying and fighting in this brand new world our team has been crafting for many years. Anthem will release for PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 on February 22nd. So, you guys are all excited for this? I don't know, it seems like an interesting mashup between Monster Hunter and, um, okay, I'm going to say a little bit, Scalebound, uh, a game that was unfortunately canceled for one stupid reason or another, and uh, Avatar. Even though Avatar never actually came out with the game, it looks like a movie. I mean, these graphics look juicy. If you're just listening to the audio on it, um, by the way, did you know, audio listener, that you can head on over to youtube.com forward slash tech news gadget and get the video and pictures? Yeah, you can do that. Or, or you can listen in, in an audio version. That's perfectly fine. But uh, if you're missing out on something, you can always have something to refer back. Just wanted to let you guys know, just in case you didn't know. But yeah, this trailer... Graphics look juicy, like, Fortnite ain't got nothing on this. And you're like, hey, what are you talking about? It's cartoon graphics. Well, I know. I like realistic graphics, too. I like the companies that spend the time and the development and, and do it right. Because when you do it right, it looks good. Like, I want to play this on a PC. I want to play this on a console. I want to play this on a PC, where it looks great. Because monitors, speaking of gaming monitors, we'll be getting back to that in a little bit. Um... I like how, how it looks. It's juicy, it feels realistic, and uh, I don't know, it feels like I just have more control with the keyboard and the mouse than I do with the joystick. Okay, I should probably stop now before I can start the console where they all start fighting with me. So for those of you guys who like making instant pot, and by pot I'm talking about rice, and by instant pot I'm talking about the company that makes the... Yeah, I don't... What are you guys crying out loud? No, I'm not talking about that. Okay, so CES debuted uh, another gadget, and um, Instant Pot and Google Assistant are teaming up. So apparently Instant Pot, which, okay, you'd understand if you were actually looking at the graphic on the screen. It's a rice cooker. Okay, I'm quite familiar with this. Um, we have one of the variations that are where I live. I had rice virtually every single day when I was in Taiwan, like seven, eight years ago. Um, and he had a rice cooker that automatically took a lot of the guesswork and the problems out of it. Um, made really good rice. Anyways, the Instant Pot Smart Wi-Fi Pressure Cooker now works with Google Assistant, the kitchen device maker announced Monday at CES in Las Vegas. Now, uh, I guess CNET reviewed the Instant Pot Smart Wi-Fi last year, and they were disappointed with its lack of virtual assistance. Now, voice commands and Google Smarts are coming to the pressure cooker. Now you can say simple things like, hey Google, set the program on my cooker to rice, and the Instant Pot Smart Wi-Fi will begin the rice function. Obviously, you know, there still is some user um, input that you have to do, like it's not going to pull the rice out of the fridge, it's not going to go out to the store and buy it for you, you still have to go and do it, um, but pre <laughs> stuff, man. <laughs> How lazy of a society have we gotten to where it's just like, eh, I can't be bothered to go to the store and buy rice and pull it out of the bag and measure it and put it in the... <sighs> Anyways, I should probably continue on with the article. I am not having a great day, as you can tell. Actually, I am. I'm just screwing around. Anyways, the Instant Pot 
smart Wi-Fi cooker already lets you monitor and control it from the Instant Pot mobile app. Adding Google Assistant voice command adds functionality, allowing you to control and check the status of the cooker totally hands-free. Um, so there you go. If you guys are looking for a smart Wi-Fi pressure cooker, it can cook rice or whatever else you deem necessary in a pressure cooker. Um, now available for your viewing and uh, eating pleasure. Because obviously, why would you want to eat it? Alright, so more news about the Samsung micro LED TV. Um, you remember what I was talking about? The whole 75 inch TV that like works like tiles that you can like rearrange? Remember when I was talking about that first, first article? Well, we got more on it. Uh, the company unveiled literally a smaller version of last year's big TV, The Wall, if you didn't remember that. Um, more than one person wondered, well, what's the difference? The answer, awkwardly, is everything and nothing. Samsung's hot new TV is a 75-inch micro-LED display that exists as a proof of concept that proved the concept. Micro-LED technology is scalable, versatile, and attainable, the company expressed in a four-hour-long showcase at the area hotel in Las Vegas. Why did you have to take four hours, though? Just let them look at it and go, ooh, pretty pictures. Probably had questions, so that's probably why. Um... Now, obviously, the fundamental technology behind this TV made its debut last year in an event space north of the Strip where Samsung revealed the wall concept, which was the 146-inch micro-LED display billed as a new type of modular TV. It could be any size and any aspect ratio because it was made of micro-LED tiles. These tiles, in principle, could snap together to create an endless array of displays, although Samsung didn't do that demo. This year, Samsung did the demo. In addition to the smaller version of the wall, the company revealed tall, skinny micro-LED displays alongside long, fat displays that broke into pieces. Samsung also had the hulking 219-inch version of the wall, which frankly looks like the highest resolution digital billboard you've ever seen. Can you imagine putting that in your house and be like, oh, I, my whole entire wall is full of a TV. Honey, I can't see anything. It's so dang bright. It's all served as a compelling illustration of what this new micro-LED technology can do and how Samsung thinks its modular aspiration could unfold, conceptually speaking, of course. Now, before we start scratching our heads on why anyone would want a tall, skinny TV, let's talk more about micro-LED technology, which is actually quite cool. Currently, the TV market is dominated by liquid crystal displays, LCDs, that are backlit by light-emitting diodes, LEDs. Everyone just calls these LED TVs to avoid drowning in alphabet soup. There are also organic light-emitting diode, OLED TVs, that make nerds swoon. Now the big difference between those two is that LED pixels need a backlight that creates the color through a color filter while OLED pixels emit light and independent colors on your own. Now if you didn't know that before, now you know. Now micro-LED technology is a fantastic Frankenstein combination of both approaches. While they emit their own red, green, and blue colors without the need for an extra backlight, micro-LED pixels don't rely on organic compounds like OLEDs, which means they don't degrade in the same way. They're also very energy efficient, a detail that's attractive for a mobile device designer. Frankly, micro-LED displays are appealing for a lot of other reasons too. In principle, they can produce those inky black blacks that OLED displays are famous for while also delivering tremendous levels of brightness in a slimmer package that uses less power. Now, this compendium of geeky detail, oversimplified as it is, is surely why Samsung de dedicated this year's TV showcase and four hours long uh, keynote to the micro LED technology. Yeah, Samsung did that last year by revealing the wall, but this year the company showed off its ambition to make micro LED technology scalable and affordable to the masses. So yeah, alongside the 75-inch mini wall, the company also revealed windows, which are smaller micro-LED panels that could conceptually be combined and rearranged to make all types and sizes of different displays. And uh, they all had, in one corner of the event there, they had an elaborate series of mechanisms to demonstrate how micro-LED displays could produce tremendously high-quality images in a wide range of configurations. There's a really long display that transformed when one panel was removed and another added. So they're doing a whole bunch of stuff. I guess this article goes on to explain a little bit more. But uh, based on a demo, looked pretty impressive so far. So if you guys are Googling out about the latest TVs, it might be one you might want to keep an eye on.
All right, so you guys are interested in uh, air taxis, right? Well, Uber Partner reveals its air taxi design at CES this year. Now, Bell, which is one of Uber's flying taxi partners, revealed the design of its vertical takeoff and landing air taxi this year, which is a five-person hybrid electric-powered vehicle with six tilting ducted fans. This vehicle is dubbed the Bell Nexus. And yes, it is to scale. This photo that you're looking at is to scale. And uh, last year, apparently I've been told uh, it was just a concept, and they said this is something we could do at last year's event. This year, they actually went a step further and went, hey, look at it. Here it is at scale. Check it out. So we got eight photos here. Um, each one, I guess, juicier than the last. Let's see. Let's swap on over here. Looking pretty promising. There's a front view of it and a person to scale. person who just decided to randomly stand right in front of the screen. Thanks, dude. Side view of it with the fan. Here's the back view. Or the front view, I don't know. That. Yeah. And I guess that slides open to reveal two. Ah. Pretty cool. So, as space at the ground level becomes limited, we must solve transportation challenges in a vertical dimension, and that's where Bell's on-demand mobility vision takes hold. Bell CEO Mitch Schneider said in a statement, The industry has anticipated the reveal of our air taxi for some time, so Bell is very proud of this moment. We believe the design, taken with our strategic approach to build this infrastructure, will lead to the successful deployment of the Bell Nexus to the world. And then here's a concept image of it flying in the air above houses. Uber is currently working with a number of companies on its future air taxi service, and Bell was an early partner. In May, Uber showed off one of its air taxi prototypes at its Uber Elevate Summit, and it says it aims to have aircraft available for commercial operations by 2023. CNBC says Uber called Bell design a major step in its effort to develop an on-demand Uber Air network. Pretty impressive. Now, do you want something that would be a huge competitive edge? Uber would be like, hey, taxi drivers. Do you have an air taxi? I didn't think so. Guess what? I pick the people up. I fly into the destination and I drop them off. Oh, and guess what? It's not on the ground. Oh, man. You just see them just erupt. Like their eyeballs pop out of their sockets. Brains explode. I can't believe it. What have we been doing driving cars around for eons? Well, maybe you should have done something else. So in line with its Uber plans, Bell's director of innovation, Scott Drennan, told The Verge that the company intends to have Nexus in operation by the mid-2020s. Quote, this is not a toy. This is an aircraft that you would feel safe and comfortable bringing your family into. Verge also reports that Bell won't have a proper working prototype until it's closer to its official launch. But uh, teaser for right now, so uh, we'll see how this goes. One step closer to flying cars. Awesome! And finally, I know you guys are all interested in gaming monitors. I already teased you guys um, last weekend with one of those gaming monitors. Well, CES has been a bumper year for PC gamers with plenty of new product announcements. It can be tricky to keep track of everything yourself. So, um, got a quick roundup here from Eurogamer.net about um, some of the monitors they looked at this year so far. First up was the Raptor Razor. Look at that. Pretty juicy. Razer has entered yet another category at CES 2019 with this announcement of the Razer Raptor, the company's first gaming monitor. As far as specification goes, Razer has selected a very common configuration, a 27-inch IPS display at 2560 by 1440 with a refresh rate of 144 hertz, which is a step up in both resolution and refresh rate over the de facto 1080p 60 hertz standard. So it's a nice choice for many users. Now the monitor supports FreeSync, adheres to the entry level HDR400 specification, and can even mirror a Razer Phone 2 via USB-C, and I showed off the Razer Phone 2 in a previous episode, but it really looks to stand out with this design. Razer has incorporated a chroma-compatible RGB light strip on the front, provided cables in their typical neon green on the back, and mounted the monitor on a stylish stand that reminds you of an open laptop. The Raptor will be available in North America later this year at 700 US dollars. Now, not to be outdone, 
ASUS introduced the ROG Strix XG438Q, the XG490VQ, and XG32VQ, which are uh, three different monitors in case you didn't know. Um, the first one is a 32 inch 1440p with 144 hertz. Um, the next one is a 43 inch with 4K at 120 hertz. And the last one is a 49 inch VFHD at 144 hertz. Let's look at the ooh, curved monitor, shall we? So let's say if you prefer an ultra wide display, ASUS has you covered with the XG49VQ, a 49 inch monitor with the same 32 by 9 aspect ratio and 3840 by 1080 resolution as the Samsung EHD90 that uh, I announced probably earlier. However, Samsung and other companies have announced its successors with a higher resolution of 5120 by 1440, making the ASUS monitor an easier to drive but less sharp alternative. Let's see, we have pricing on it. Um, no pricing details yet. It will be released later in January, so we shall see. Also, HP debuted their Omen X 65 Imperium for that monitor. Oh boy, it almost looks like a, it kind of looks like a mini TV screen, doesn't it? The Omen X Imperium is the first big format gaming display to be available for pre-order following their announcement by NVIDIA at last year's CES event. To recap, the BFGD specification calls for a 65-inch screen at 4K resolution with a 144Hz refresh rate and full G-Sync HDR support. The Omen X Experium comes with NVIDIA Shield built-in, allowing access to Android apps and the Google Assistant, and some models will arrive with an integrated soundbar as well. However, you will be spending a lot to get the ultimate big screen gaming display with the Omen X Imperium arriving in February for 5,000 US dollars and similar big screens from Acer and Asus expected to cost around a similar amount as well. It'll be interesting to see how these screens compare to LG's 2019 OLEDs, which should also boast low input lag and a high refresh rate, albeit 120 hertz instead of 144. They'll also come with free sync support that could work with NVIDIA GeForce graphic cards thanks to NVIDIA's recent G-Sync compatible announcement. So, the last one we'll be looking at is the ViewSonic Elite. Elite? I can't talk, as you can see. XG240R and XG350RC. ViewSonic announced its new Elite gaming sub-brand at CES, including two new models at wildly different price points, obviously, because if you look at it here, one looks like a wider screen, one's just like a default monitor kind of screen. The device, I believe on the photo on the left, is intended as a strong budget option. The 24-inch 1080p TN display featuring 144Hz FreeSync. The Elite features a more gamer look than previous ViewSonic products, as well as support for RGB synchronization with thermal takes, Razer Chroma, and Cooler Master products. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, so the Elite XG240R is available now for $273, and that's the one on the right. I'm looking at the photo. The smaller one, not the big curved one. Why? So confusing. Anyways, where's the arc? On the other side of the spectrum is the 35 inch 3440 by 1440 curved ultra wide VA display. The free sync display also supports the relatively demanding HDR10 standard, which could make it a good choice for fans of HDR gaming or video. It has a refresh rate of 100Hz, which is typical for a monitor of this size and resolution, and still provides a solid upgrade over 60Hz gaming. It will be available later this month for 789 US dollars. So, there you have it guys, that wraps up everything that happened at CES 2019 on the first day of the Consumer Electronics Show. Obviously, um, there was a bunch of other products that went out and uh, <laughs> some are a little bit more goofier than others, but I, this is basically the highlights that I was able to find so far. I'll be back tomorrow with probably day two and, and if anything else interesting came out. Granted, I know a lot of TV announcements are made during this time. Granted, I know a lot of auto announcements are coming out because I guess a lot of auto companies like to show up now and show off their latest tech and, and a smart AI compatible device or how cool their car is. So we'll see if anything interesting comes out. But uh, in the meantime, if we miss something on a show or something that you want us to keep you informed on, be sure to let us know on Twitter. Our handle there is at 
Tech News Gadget. We also have a community over at technewsgadget.net forward slash forum where you can hang out with other people and comment on today's episode or any other episode and talk about tech. By the way, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to tell a friend and leave a like. That will do it for this episode of the latest in tech news. I'm your host, Taylor Merrick, for the latest in tech, gadgets, and gaming news. Be sure to head on over to technewsgadget.net. Pretty much, keep being awesome, guys, and I'll see you on the flip side. Thank you.